In June 2022, two Air France pilots were suspended for a very unusual reason. They had been fighting with each other in the cockpit. Just after takeoff from Geneva Airport, something happened between the, two, the pilot and the co-pilot. The details were never made public, but it resulted in them physically attacking each other. The fight was so bad that members of the cabin crew heard the commotion, came into the cockpit to separate them. And for the rest of the flight, until it landed safely, one of the cabin crew sat in the cockpit to make sure that the fight didn't uh, kick off once again. Now, Air France claimed that this altercation did not affect the safety of the flight. But if you were on that airline... The last thing you would want for your pilots to be doing is to be fighting each other. You would not be wanting that to happen. The job of a pilot is far too important for disagreements to be expressed like this. But that's the same in church too. As God's people, we too have an important job to do. And it's always disastrous if we end up fighting each other. So when Paul heard that this was happening in the church in Philippi, he wrote to try and get it sorted out. And we're going to read from Philippians chapter 4, verse 1 to 5 this morning. And Tony's going to come and read for us now. Thanks, Tony. Therefore, my brothers, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, this is how you should stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. I plead with Yodia and I plead with Syntyche to agree to, with each other in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, loyal York fellow, help these women who have contended at my side in the cause of the gospel, along with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Thank you very much, Tony. Yodia and Syntyche were committed Christians in Philippi. Paul says that their names are in the book of life. So they trusted in Jesus... And in his finished work on the cross. And as a result they were forgiven. They were adopted into God's family. And they were guaranteed a place in heaven. And they'd also courageously stood with Paul. To share the gospel in this violent and immoral city of Philippi. As Paul said in verse verse 3. They have contended at my side. In the cause of the gospel. But since then, something had happened. Their relationship with each other had broken down. Disagreement had led to division and distance between them. These two mature believers in Jesus had fallen out with each other. Now, I think we need to be honest with each other that this thing can happen. And it can happen to any of us. None of us are immune from these problems. Even Paul himself struggled with this just before he got to Philippi. On their first missionary journey, Paul and Barnabas had taken Barnabas' cousin, John Mark, with them on that journey. But for some reason, John Mark, during that mission trip, had given up. And he deserted them. He'd he'd headed back home. However, when they came around to launch out into their second missionary journey, Barnabas wanted to take John Mark with them again. He wanted to give him another another chance. 
another opportunity to serve alongside them. But Paul disagreed. Maybe he believed that their mission was too important and too challenging to take somebody who had proved themselves unreliable along with them. They needed people on their team that they could really depend on. So Paul and Barnabas disagreed. Interestingly, Luke, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, never says who was right and who was wrong here. It doesn't say that Paul was right and Barnabas was wrong, or Barnabas was right and Paul was wrong. And people have argued over this for years. And said Luke just recorded that they'd had a sharp disagreement, that they parted company. In a sense, you could say good came out of it. Because Barnabas took John Mark and they went to Cyprus to share the gospel. And Paul, he gathered together another team and they went off and eventually got to Philippi. So two teams resulted of this rather than one mission team. But still this was a really sad end to a partnership between these two guys that had worked together in the service of the Lord. So disagreements can happen. Even between mature followers of Jesus. But in church life, they need to be resolved. Because disagreements can be so destructive. That's why Paul was so strong in his request for these women to agree together. I plead with, he said in verse 2. He earnestly urged them because it was a serious issue. Paul made a, a similar kind of appeal to the church in Corinth when he wrote to them. He said this in chapter 1 of that letter. I appeal to you that all of you agree with one another so that there be no divisions among you. Paul was desperate to see those disagreements and those divisions resolved in these churches because he knew how damaging they could be. And on the other hand, he knew how how much of a blessing unity, true unity is. I think Psalm 133 describes that blessing. If you want to get your Bible again, flick over to Psalm 133, verse 1. David started that incredible psalm by this. He said, how good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. Disharmony destroys and discourages us. Causes sadness and distress. Sleepless nights and heavy hearts. But unity, unity is satisfying. It's wonderful. It blesses us. How good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity. And David went on to describe that blessing. Look at verse 2 of that psalm. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down upon the collar of his robes. Pictures the anointing of Aaron as the high priest who had been anointed with oil. And that oil consecrated him. It set him apart from the world and set him apart in service for God. And it was a sign of the anointing of the Holy Spirit in his life. In the same way, unity among God's people prepares us to worship the Lord. It is a sign that we belong to him. That we are indwelt by his spirit. But then David said, verse 3 of that psalm, It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. 
the Mount Hermon is a high peak in Syria. And so the, the dew falls heavy on it. So in a hot and dry land like Mount Zion, that would symbolize something incredibly refreshing, something invigorating, if the dew of Hermon fell on Mount Zion. So in the same way, unity in the community of God's people refreshes us. It gives us strength. It gives us renewed energy. It's my privilege to to pray each month with leaders of different churches, different evangelical churches around our county. We meet up once a month and, and pray together. And there are differences among us, among our beliefs and among our practices as different churches. And yet as we pray for each other, as we pray for our families, as we pray for our churches, as we pray for our county, we experience that refreshing from God. That refreshing of unity in Christ. This is what helps us all to stand firm in the Lord, as Paul said back in Philippians chapter 4, verse 1. We stand strong when we stand together. As David concluded that psalm, verse 3, For there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life evermore. God's blessing, His power, His work is experienced when God's people are united. So unity blesses us. It's a blessing for us when we can gather together united as one. But this unity, this blessing of unity is not just for our benefit. It's not just for us to experience and us to keep to ourselves. It's a blessing that also impacts others. This is what Jesus prayed for before he went to the cross. In that incredible prayer in John chapter 17, he prayed, May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Jesus prayed for his people to be brought to unity so the world would know that God had sent Jesus. The reality of who Jesus is. And the reality that these people are God's people. So as we've seen in this letter beforehand, unity is an essential part of our witness to this world. If we're divided, if we're at war with each other, then how can we expect God's power to be working among us? How are we going to impact our community if we can't work together in unity? Where there is disharmony inside the church, there is defeat outside of it. If we're going to impact our generation for Christ, we need to be united together. This is what the early church lived out. Acts 4 says this. All the believers were one in heart and mind. And as a result, they had an incredible impact on their generation. Unity blesses us. Unity blesses others. But unity also blesses God. I'm sure all of us who are parents love to see our kids get on really well for those one or two minutes when they do that. We're blessed when they support each other, when they care for each other, when they enjoy time together, don't they? In a similar way, God's heart is blessed when he sees his kids live together in unity. Next Saturday, as I mentioned earlier, is our international night. And we're going to celebrate that there is neither Jew nor Greek, 
slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. We are an incredibly diverse group of people, divided by culture, by age, by language, by background, by experience, by status. And yet in Christ, we've been united together as one. One body. One church. Because we're loved by one Father. We've been rescued by one Savior. We're indwelt by one Spirit. So unity is God's plan and purpose for us. It's what Jesus came to produce. And it glorifies God because it reflects the unity of God. As God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit have always lived in perfect unity. So God is blessed when he sees those who have put their faith in Christ live out this unity in their everyday lives. And that means we must not let our personal disagreements divide us. We should make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace, as Paul says in Ephesians 4. We need to make every effort It also means that when disagreements come into our lives, into our church life, we should do everything that we can to resolve them. This is why Paul pleaded with these women to agree with each other. He wanted these Christians to resolve their disagreements so that they could get back to living in harmony with each other and expressing the attitude that Paul talked about earlier in this this letter of being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. So that's what Paul was pleading for. But he was really careful in doing this. I don't know if you noticed this when we read it. Verse 2. He addressed each each of these women equally. I plead with Yodia and I plead with Syntyche. He wanted to be completely even-handed and so he urged each side of this disagreement equally. And I think in doing this, he was showing them that this was, they were not to wait for one, one another, the other person, to make the first move. Both of them had to work to resolve this difficulty. Yodia, please do what you can to resolve this. Syndicate, please do what you can to resolve this. I think this is what Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 18. Verse 15, Jesus said this, If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault, just between the two of you. Whether we are the one who has been wronged, or we are the one who who is in the wrong, Jesus wants us to make the first move. He wants us to take that first step. We need to be proactive in seeking reconciliation. It's not good enough to say, well, if they come to me, I'll I'll accept that. We need to be willing to take that first step. But sometimes we can't resolve our differences on our own. Sometimes we've tried, and it just hasn't worked. In those situations, God calls others to get involved to help. To bring about that healing and restoration. That's what Paul called his friend to do here in verse 3. I ask you, loyal yoke fellow, help these women. Divisions and disagreements between believers are just a private concern. Because they impact the entire church. And so it's sometimes appropriate for the church to get involved to try and help to bring about reconciliation. 
Again, back in Matthew 18. Jesus told them, said, that after encouraging individuals to, to work for a reconciliation, he said this, but if you will not listen, you know, if somebody goes and speaks to them and they won't, won't listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If you go and try and bring about resolution and it doesn't work, then bring somebody else you can really trust into that situation and see if they can help to bring about that healing of that relationship. Of course, that role is not easy. It's not simple to try and bring two people or or two groups of people who have been divided, bring them together. But it is our calling as Christians. We're not just allowed to say, to step back and say, well, it's nothing to do with me. And just leave people to be separate. We are called to care enough to try to help. Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. But if we're going to get involved in this, we need to be really careful how we do this. Because confronting issues with the wrong attitude can do more harm than good. So look what Paul says in verse 5 of our reading. He says, let your gentleness be evident to all. When we're hurt, it's natural to respond with a desire for retaliation and revenge. Sometimes even when you try to step in and helping two groups to, to reconcile, even there you can be frustrated and you can get angry with others and think, well, why don't you ever just get together and sort this out? But as Christians, we're called to be gentle. We're called to be patient. We're called to be forbearing, forgiving, merciful, loving. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love, Paul says in Ephesians 4. This kind of attitude, it won't just protect our hearts from bitterness and anger that can fester away and just destroy our attitudes and destroy our heart. But it will also enable us to more quickly come to that place of restoration. And so minimize the hurt that's caused by it. It's really important that we have that attitude. Especially because that attitude is the attitude of Christ with us. But it's really interesting that Paul here, he doesn't mention the cause of the disagreement between Yodia and Syntyche, does he? He doesn't tell us about whether this issue that divided them was a doctrinal one, a lifestyle one, a church life one, or maybe just even a personality clash between them. Paul didn't focus on that. Instead, he focused on the more important issue that should unite them. He said that they were to agree with each other in the Lord. They need to focus on the fact that they were together members of the one family. Whatever the issue was that divided them, They need to remember that they were united in Christ. I think often in the middle of a disagreement, all we can see is the stuff that we disagree over. You ever notice that? It kind of blinkers us. And all we see is all the problems. That becomes our focus. That becomes the main or the only issue that we can focus on. But instead... As believers, we need to keep our eyes fixed on the reality that God has joined us together. And that everything that might divide us is secondary to what unites us. I think Paul modelled that in verse 1 of our reading. Look what he says. He called them 
my brothers. And we might just kind of skim over that, but that's no small miracle here. Paul, as you remember, he was the, 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 he used to be the Pharisee, the strict Pharisee, who would have done everything he could to keep away from Gentiles. And now, he's celebrating his connection with those Gentiles. That they are, they are united as one family. That they have one father. And then he called them, you, you whom I love and long for. My dear friends. At the heart of the Christian life should be the heart of God's love. And Paul was willing to express this tender heart to his Christian family. He was connected to them by his love for them. And then he also called them my joy and my crown. He saw them as his victor's crown. Success in his life was to see these people who he loved, who he had led to Christ, who he was trying to encourage them in their walk with Christ, to see them stand with him in God's presence and share in the glory of heaven. That's what filled Paul's heart with joy. That was his goal. That was his reward. And it's that focus that will keep us united with each other, even when we disagree over secondary issues. Because we need to remember that we are one in Christ. That we are brothers and sisters together in one family. That we are connected by God's love. And that faithfulness, success in our service is not just measured by what we do in our lives but also by how much we've helped others fulfill everything that God wants for them in their lives. So how can we keep those truths at the forefront of our minds? How can we keep living in that reality each day? How can we keep focused on what is ultimately important? Well, I think Paul gave us an indication to this in verse 4. When he said, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. I'm sure if you've been with us through this series, you've seen that, that joy is a recurring theme in this, in this letter. But the, the foundation of that joy, the ultimate reason for that joy, Rejoice in the Lord. We can constantly rejoice in who Jesus is and what He has done. That's because He alone is worthy of this. There's no one else and nothing else that can give us a reason for joy constantly, no matter what is happening in our life. This is what Paul himself expressed when he was in Philippi on that second missionary journey. Even though their backs were bleeding and their feet were in stocks, in prison, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. They were rejoicing in the Lord always. And if we choose to do this in our lives, if we make Jesus our focus, our reason for joy, our treasure, our delight, then all the things that might cause division, whether it's our status, our position, our agenda, our feelings, all of that will take second place. And instead, like Paul, we will say, we make it our, our goal to please him. Make it our goal to please him. And if we're focused on pleasing the Lord, 
then we'll not fight with his people. We'll love them because we love him. But there's just one final encouragement for us to do this, just at the end of our reading. I'm sure you noticed it right at the end. The Lord is near. We could read this as a reminder of the Lord's presence with us this morning. That as we face difficulties and disagreements, we don't handle this on our own. Jesus is with us. And that's a great truth to hold on to. But I think that what Paul is really focusing on here is it's a reminder of the nearness of the Lord's coming. One day, Jesus is coming back for us. And we don't know when that is. None of us know it. But we can be sure that that day is nearer than ever before. And so we don't need to fight for justice in every situation. We don't need to demand that that we are justified in every disagreement. We don't need to to get satisfaction in every argument. Instead, we can wait for the Lord to sort this out in His perfect timing. This is what Jesus Himself did when He was so cruelly treated. 1 Peter chapter 2 says this, When they hurled their insults at Him, at the Lord, He did not retaliate, When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. One day the Lord's going to sort it all out. One day the Lord is going to bring perfect justice in this world. Not not yet, but one day. So we can leave it in God's hands. We don't need to fight every battle. We don't need to demand justice because we can trust that God will deal with that in His perfect timing. But the coming of the Lord also encourages us to live in unity because we remember that those of us who have trusted in Jesus are those whose names are written in the book of life. So like we were thinking about last week, We are citizens of heaven. And there's no division there. One day, when we see Jesus face to face as one people and with one voice, we will worship Him perfectly united with all of God's people who have trusted in Jesus. And if that is the reality of what we will do one day when we get to heaven... That is how God wants us to live today. To live today as citizens of heaven. God wants us to serve without fighting each other. So although disagreements happen, even among mature followers of Jesus, disagreements need to be resolved. Because unity brings so much blessing into our lives. But the great news is that disagreements can be resolved. If we're willing to be proactive, to be helpful, to be gentle, to be focused on what is ultimately important. And most of all, to be centered on Christ. The one that we are rejoicing in. And the one that we are eagerly waiting for.